that it's a delight to be with you. And uh, I love your pastor. He's a great guy. I love his family. What a delight it was to have them at our church for all those years. And uh, now to see what he's doing and to know that this church has now birthed another church in Redmond. Way to go. You guys are doing a great job. So uh, in some ways, I come down here to get to see one of our children and now grandchildren. So it's wonderful. So it's good. Um, and I love this church. I love what you're doing. I, I thank you for the opportunity to come and visit with you. I say, ag agreeing with, uh, with John as well, that uh, happy Father's Day to all of you. And I recognize when I say happy Father's Day to you, and what a great opportunity to dedicate children on uh, Father's Day. It's beautiful. But when I say happy Father's Day to you, I realize that for some of you, maybe as a child, you're thinking, I'm not sure Dad's having a good day today. Maybe because of choices you've made. Or maybe as a father, you're not having a good day today because you thought, I don't think I've been the father I could have been. Or maybe you're here just broken because uh, your children are not where you'd like them to be. So there's always a lot of mixed emotions that go on in a day like this. And now having lived a number of years of life, I probably on Father's Day have experienced every one of those emotions. Uh, most of them have been joyous times, but sometimes they've been very difficult. And uh, you even question, uh, you know, what is, what is my role as a father? How well am I doing? And, and there may even be some level of guilt that is associated with that. So I recognize that as a parent, as a father, addressing specifically fathers today, that I suppose that there is no, no other area of life that brings more joy than being a parent. Jen and I were married for seven years before we had our first child. And when that child was born, oh my, what a time of celebration. Actually, our only child born here in, uh, in the state of Oregon. We were in seminary at the time in Portland, and it was just an incredible day. You know, you look at that baby now. I look back and see some pictures. Actually, she had a little hematobe on top of her head, and, and all her eyes weren't working right. And I thought she was beautiful. A little biased, I understand, but if I really was objectively looking at her, I would have thought, I wonder what's wrong with this baby. This, this is not normal, is it? And I didn't say that in the presence of my wife, but I did think it in the quietness of my heart. I had some wisdom, you know. But what a joyful day that was. And I would say that is true for all three of our children that are born to us. But I have to also say that um, not only is being a parent one of the most joyful things you do, but it's also one of the greatest responsibilities and may be associated with some of the deepest hurt you'll ever experience in all of life. So it's really important for us to understand now, I'm going to talk to fathers today, but the application of what I'm talking about here applies to every one of us, because I want to meet people like this father in the story that I'm going to read for you. I want to meet people like that in the church. I want to be this kind of man uh, for God's glory and for your benefit. I want to be this kind of person, and I trust that God will allow that. So if you'll turn with me to um, Luke chapter 15, and this is probably one of the most familiar stories in all of the Bible. This is just, a, we just know it. And I have preached this text more than once. I preached it from the perspective of the uh, son who rebelled and moved away from his family. I have preached it in terms of the... Um, older brother who was pharisaical in his nature, a little self-righteous, but I've never preached this text dealing with the heart of the father. And we actually call this the, the prodigal son and speak as if the whole thing is about the prodigal son. 
the one who has moved off in extravagance and sin and disobedience. But I think it should better be phrased, and in my Bible it's got right there as a caption, the prodigal son. I really think it should be called the, the father's love. This, this is what I see, and not only for the younger son, but even for the older son. But we're going to focus then on just the <clears throat> first few verses, actually through verse 24. And, and I read from you from God's Word to us this morning. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And he said, a man had two sons. Now this is Jesus who was teaching. He's already taught about the lost sheep. He's taught about the lost coin. Each one of these is talking about a difficult situation uh, some deliberate, as we see in the story this morning, some inadvertent, but each one talking about a difficult situation, recaptured by the focus on God, and then rejoicing in the midst of that. We see that same theme running through this. And he said, Jesus speaking here, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country, and he sent uh, him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one's giving him anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up. Go to my father, I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. Hmm. Father, we have read your holy word here. You deliberately gave this story, Lord Jesus. You gave it in the context of real people in real time for a very real purpose. And now, these many, many years later, we sit under the same instruction of these words in real time, with real people, with real needs and real desperate desire to understand, Lord, what you are trying to teach us. We're thankful that you are a God who delights in revealing his character to us and allowing us the opportunity to embrace that for the transformation in our lives. Would you speak to us in this passage, Lord? May we be ready listeners and not just listeners, but Lord, we want to obey. We want to emulate what we find in this passage. Bless this time to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the theme is, a loving father eagerly watches for his child to return home in repentance. Now that's true of an earthly father. It is also true of a heavenly father as well. He eagerly anticipates the time when a child will return in repentance. We capture very quickly here that the story initially is about 
a rebellious son. And if we all have ever, even as uh, believers or followers, moved into a pattern of sin, we know, as it has been stated, sin will take you further than you ever thought you would ever go. It will cause you to linger longer there than you ever intended to stay. And it will cost you more than you ever intended to pay. That's the hideous nature of sin. It is ugly. It is deceptive. It is death. And this is exactly what this young man has fallen into. He moved away from all that was known to him at this point and moved into a state of sin. Now again, I say to you, you could be here this morning in that very condition. You may be that son. We're not talking about age here. We're talking about a, a, dis a disposition, a choice that you make to say, I'm going to move away from this and I'm going to do otherwise. I'm tired of this instruction, but today you're here and you're thinking, what a miserable choice I made. What a foolish thing. I love that when it says, and he came to his senses. He came to be keenly aware. I have made some foolish foolish choices. May I say to you that that is what all sin is. Sin is a foolish choice. Sin is an active state of rebellion against a good God who means well to you and who has the best for you. But when we rebel against him, we are saying to ourselves and to others, I know better than God. And certainly this young man was saying, I think I know better than you, Dad. And I want what is entitled to me, and I want it now. That's the story that is oftentimes preached about, and oftentimes for the very purpose of bringing about hopeful repentance of those who have been foolish in their state. But what I want to capture for us this morning is more of the heart of the Father. Now, there are several aspects to this story. Only a few verses are given to his part of the story, but they're full of meaning. There's the part that we have to read into here, and that's the hurt of a father. And we have to see, in addition to that, uh, the love of a father. And then in addition to that, we have to see the forgiveness of a father. Now, I believe we see that in the heart of Jesus. The Scriptures tell us that, I mean, in, into our Heavenly Father, the Scriptures tell us that we should not grieve the Holy Spirit. That means we can grieve God. We can cause God pain by the choices that we make. And I see that the fact that God is a loving God, and He desires for us to be drawn back to Him, and I see that He's also a forgiving God. And He illustrates that in this story. But the hurt is what we see, first of all, that is there. I think the first hurt that this father had to experience was the rejection. The rejection of his own person from his son, the rejection of the values that he held to, and that rejection that came, walked away, no longer wanting to be a part of that. I see in Scripture that one of the most difficult times in anyone's life is being rejected. And if you're rejected without cause and without understanding, it's even more severe. We see that certainly in the life of Joseph with his brothers. Rejected and judged and sold into slavery and in a foreign land and all of that went on through there. I believe the biggest thing that Joseph had to learn to deal with was the severity of that rejection with really no understanding, just a cruel act of one. And I believe this is what the father had to go through. Uh, you who are parents and have experienced any flavor of this, it becomes a confusing time. It is a hurtful time. You, you say, what, what went wrong? What, what is there about my life that you don't want, you don't desire. And, and what have I modeled to you that what's forcing you to rebel against that? And all of that confusion and that hurt that 
races into a heart. In addition to rejecting the person of his father and the values, there had to be the humiliation that went with that. The scriptures are very clear as we read in the Old Testament and the book of Deuteronomy that there was a, a, a clear pattern about how we were to give our heritage away, our, our wealth, and uh, how they were to receive the inheritance. And it was under the direction of the Father, and it was His choice, and He would distribute those things. And there was even a very clear protocol of what amount should be given to older and younger and so forth. But it was at the discretion of the Father. It was never at the request of the Son. That would be uh, publicly embarrassing to this father. And in fact, I, in my study for this passage, there was one man that I read about that he actually had lived in the Middle East for 20 years, and much of these older practices are still in keeping in that, in that region of the country. And he said in all of the years that he lived there, with all of the families that he knew, he could record no record, and even as he asked others, of anyone who had gone to their father and embarrassed their father by demanding, yes, what was rightfully due them at some point, but demanding that prematurely. It's almost as if saying, Dad, I care so little about you that life would really be better off if you were dead. But you're not dead so at least give me what would come to me when you do die. I, I, I think we have to see that that's the spirit of this young man. And, and we understand that he's driven by this horizontal-like lot who could see the, the, the possibility of, the, of what he could accomplish in life and how he could do it better, and, and we see that. The humiliation that would come to the Father, can you... Imagine with his friends, where's your son? Oh, he's gone. And I see that your wealth has declined. Oh, I, gave him, I gave him that point. Why did you do that? We, we don't do it that way. Why, why would you ever? This is embarrassing. And of course it was. I think there's a third part that I want to read into knowing in my years of uh, pastoring, in my years of being a parent, my years now of being a grandfather, I think there is an association if something goes wrong in the family that we're responsible for that. And there's a sense of guilt that comes to our lives. We, we misquote uh, Proverbs 22 and Verse 6, you know, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from that. And we take that as a promise from God, and somehow we conclude that if our child doesn't turn out right, we failed in some way. We don't know where to put the blame fully in terms of what we've done, but we have that sensation that we've failed, and there's great guilt in that. And we even can come back before the presence of God and say, God, is there something I could have done better? Should I have loved more? Should I have disciplined more? Should I have been here more? Should I have talked more? We ask those questions. And if you've ever had a child who's rebelled, I will guarantee you that'll be the course of thinking that you have. And you'll relive many parts of that life. This man was deeply hurting. He was broken. His life was shattered. And at this point, he had no recourse. There was no recourse. The son, only a few days after gaining his wealth, and there probably had to be some procedure where they had to go through and get everything in order so the father could give him this wealth, and then only a few days after that, the Scripture says, he leaves his father. He goes to another country. Not only do I 
not want to be associated with your dad. I don't even want to be in the same town where you're in. I don't even be in the same country you're in. And of course, he lives uh, a careless, self-centered, sinful life. And the father is left with no recourse, no conversation, no update, no report, just the shattered state of brokenness. I talked to a person one time who was having difficulty with their child, and I asked them, I said, so what do you do in these days when you have no contact, when there is no, no, uh, no seeming possible recourse here? What, what do you do? He said, oh, I desperately cling to God for any sense of light any sense of understanding, any sense of clarity. In fact, I move away from my time with God to do certain things, but I come back to God and say, God, life does not make sense to me. I do not understand. I long for the presence of my son. I long for the warmth of his hug. I long for the conversation. God, nothing makes sense. Well, what does he do? He guards his heart. And that's what I want to see here because I think we begin to capture part of this. One of the temptations that comes to us when people no longer walk the course that we walk or say the things that we say or do the things that we do and, ma and mock us and make fun of us, our tendency is, is to reject them. I just won't have anything to do with you. I'll write you off. I have seen people who have done that with their children and have not talked, had lunch with a man this week, have not talked to their children for years. And when they bring up the name of child, this week I didn't bring up this guy, I didn't mention Father's Day coming up, because there's a root of bitterness that has settled into this man's life and his whole face will grimace in pain and will show uh, ugliness and anger and bitterness. That's how he's choosing to deal with that. Some people do that, and they horizontally go and blame, and there may have been even some justification for that. I love this man's heart because we do not see in the face of rebellion any element here of the father rejecting that child. That's amazing. I mean, that's amazing. And, and I'm going to keep making these parallels for us because if you haven't experienced that with your family, you're blessed. You're blessed. But certainly we've experienced that with our heavenly father, those times when we have willfully walked in opposition to God. And then we have found that God doesn't withhold from us. He hasn't rejected us. He's been hurt by us. And really, if we think about it, the one we've offended the most is the one we long most desperately to speak to, God our Father. I believe this man had so protected his heart that in the event, and of course we know it does take place, in the event his son comes home He's ready to receive him. The first step of loving someone else is not to reject them. I had a phone call one year ago today, not today, but this time of the year, from a man that I deeply love and highly respect and called me up. And um, when he spoke my name, I felt the heaviness of his life. And I knew that he was going to say something to me in the next few minutes that was going to reveal uh, something devastating. And before he spoke a word, I said, I want to say something to you, that nothing I'm going to hear in the next few minutes will change my love for you and my respect for you. And then he shared it. Now, for this last year, I've been walking with him through the healing process. Let me just say something. When you reject someone 
and judge them and isolate yourself from them because what they've done is by your judgment and the judgment of others, ugly and hideous. It is ugly by the word of God. It is ugly by the voice of God. It is ugly. But when you reject them and refuse to walk with them, I'm going to tell you what you miss. You miss the opportunity to see the greatest display of the grace of God in the restoration of that brother or sister in the Lord. And you are left over here with a pious mindset that I would never do that. I would never be a part of that. And I have seen people treat this man this way. And I went down to be with him just two weeks ago for the very purpose of being with him and his wife and witness the miraculous, glorious grace of God in his life. Now, if you want to live a protected life, then you better get away from grace because grace is messy. Grace is not messy, but it deals with messy people. And if you don't believe that, you don't need grace. This man had protected his heart. I trust that you will be a congregation that protects your heart so that when some of your brothers and sisters has a struggle... That they'll know the safest place for them to go in the midst of their struggle is right here because they know they will be overwhelmed by love. Mm. Are you that kind of church? I think you are. I think I would come here and talk to you. I think you'd love me. Mm. We see in verse 20 that he never stopped caring. So he got up and came to his father, the son did. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. He never stopped caring. Now, I don't see him going after his son. It doesn't say that there was getting the latest reports. It doesn't say that uh, he was going into that country, but it does tell us one thing. He looked for him every day. Don't you think he was there every day? Every day. Maybe today. Maybe today. Maybe today. I don't know how long it went. I don't know how much money he got. I don't know how long it took him to spend it. But it had been a time that he was still out there looking. I love that he never stopped caring. In rejection, in humiliation, in grief, that's the possibility that you stop caring. And you do that for self-protection. But to keep caring opens up the vulnerability of your heart. And then I love this. He showed compassion. Still a long way off, his father saw him, he cared, and felt compassion. Hmm. That compassion is the ability to move alongside of the pain of another with the hope of bringing about a change. That's what compassion does. And so when he saw his son coming to the distance, he, oh, this is what I've been looking for. This is what I've been looking for. This is my opportunity. And not only did he show, did he have compassion, but he revealed it because of the action that he took. No, notice what it says here. He saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. That's before any words were said. The, 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 the son says the words later. He ran to him. Now, in that time, it was the practice for old men not to run. It was not dignified. And I have to say to you that as I become an old man and I attempt to run, it just doesn't look dignified. I mean, it just doesn't look dignified. I, I, and there's it, men, you just don't look good that way. I mean, it's just, just don't look. I don't, and take a video and prove it to me. 
But this man had a total disregard for the customs of the day, had no regard for how others may see him or perceive or understand or or, or any sense of dignity because it didn't matter. The greatest thing that he'd hoped for was now taking place. They ran to him. Couldn't even wait for him to get there. And he says, embraced him. Now, I don't know how much time the son had to clean up. Remember, he had just come from the hogs. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. We'd have to speculate that. I like because I think it enhances the story and sounds good. I think he stunk. I think he was dirty. I think he was desperate. I don't think he was attractive. Now, all of that speculation, that's not verified by the Scripture, but it sure makes it sound better when he embraced him, didn't it? Because it doesn't matter what they've done, where they've been. You're coming home. You're coming home, and that's what matters. And then it says that he kissed him. One of our grandchildren said to us the other day, my wife, says, you know, when granddad leaves, it's not one of those mushy kisses. It's just a Now, part of that's because I've grown this goatee and my wife doesn't particularly like it. That's my problem. But it's just a little, you know, and maybe that's what happens when you've been married over 50 years. And maybe we need to go back to that. But that's nothing close to what was going on here. He lavished these kisses upon him. Kiss, I mean, you have to, inv- the verbiage, he kissed him repeatedly over and over again, on the neck, on the cheek, on the face. Man, it just couldn't stop kissing him. It's like really a grandmother with the seeing the grandbaby for the first time. And she just, oh, come down, Nana. You know that? Knock it off, Nana. You know, he's a boy. kissed him. I wonder what was going through that son's mind. I, this had to be such a paradigm shift. And then it doesn't stop there. Now, he's displaying his affection here. And, and the son then says, rehearsed probably often, thinking, I don't know what dad's response is going to be, but in between the embraces and the kisses and the running and now going back to the house here because we see preparation is going to be made here. Servants have arrived. They're witnessing all of this. He says, Father, I sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, remember, he had rehearsed this just a little differently And he said, when he came to his senses, verse 17, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here of hunger. I will get to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy called your son. Make me one of your hired men. He didn't even get his speech finished. The father (laughs) didn't care about where he'd been and what he'd done. He was caring about where he currently was. He's home. Let's celebrate that. I've sat down with people, and their journey has not been good. And they say, you know, I I, I think I need to tell you about this. I said, you don't have to tell me anything. Now, if you want to and you think that helps you in your journey, I don't need any details here. You know something, friends? I do not need a new news flash about what sin looks like. Haven't you seen enough sin in your life? Don't you know what it looks like? I don't need another current report. So if you're coming back from sin, I don't need to know that. I just want to know where are you going? Where are you going? Now this guy was, if the son had practiced what he was going to do, don't you think the father had thought, oh, if my son ever comes back, if my son ever comes back, whoo, what a party. What a party we're going to have. 
That's what he does. So we see then the generosity expressed here. Go get my best robe. That's probably his own personal robe. It may have been his best one that he had. It was his. Go get, go get not just a robe, the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, implying, perhaps a signet ring, implying a, a, a re-embracement of authority. And sandals on his feet. And sandals were only worn by family members. Servants didn't have sandals. And so by action, even though the son was saying, I'm willing to be a servant, he's saying, no, 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 you're, you're here. This is it. And he said, and go out and bring in the fattened calf. We're going to have some veal tonight and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. And the whole reason of this for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. You see, the older son here, which we're not going to go into, didn't want to celebrate because it didn't fit his profile of what life should be. You know, friends, you can live a self-righteous life and you can act as if you've never sinned, but I know better. <laughs> and what we ought to do is get on the side of grace and love and forgiveness, huh? Full acceptance, undeserved understanding. What did he give his guy? The father forgave him. Forgave him immediately. Forgave him completely. And forgave him restoratively. Completely. I, I think sometimes we as Christians, although we don't believe in penance, that is, where we have to pay for our sins. We believe that Jesus has paid for our sins. We celebrate that. But I think sometimes when people have moved into sin, and if it seems to be more gross sin, then we almost treat them as if they have to do penance. They have to perform a certain way until we can embrace them. I am so glad that my Father's heart is that, not that way. I believe my Father in heaven is represented right here when he says, when you come home, we will celebrate right now. This is when we'll have the party because this is a display of my grace. This is a display of my mercy. This is a display of my love. This is a display. It doesn't get any better right now than the time of party and celebration. And for you to go through a sense of penance and time and struggle, that implies you have something to do with this party. This party is about me, the Father says, and what I'm doing. And you can't earn this. This is my gift to you. You missed it. That would have been a wonderful time for you to say, amen, Brother Mike. That is so rich. That is so rich. That is so true. I don't want it now. <laughs> but you could have. Isn't, isn't this a great story? You know what? This is not this prodigal son's story. This is our story. I don't have to go to the depths of the sin of this man. I've been in sin. You know, people always talk about when they reach the bottom. I don't know what the bottom is, but I know it's ugly. And I have a father who says, welcome home, son. Welcome home. I'll give you three passages of Scripture, but I don't have time to look at. But three passages that says we are to love, we are to accept, and we're to forgive pattern that we see here is not just the heavenly father to us, not this father to his son. It is our pattern in the church. In John chapter 13, verse 34, we're to love each other just as Christ has loved us. We're to accept each other. Romans 15, 7 just as Christ has accepted us. We're to forgive each other, Ephesians 4, 31, 
just as God in Christ has forgiven us. The love pattern, the acceptance pattern, and the forgiveness pattern are not something you make up. It's not something you have to design. It's already outlined by God. We just have to do it. We just have to do it. I love what it says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. You know, that's a verse we don't always get to look at. Just turn with me, and that's the last verse I look at. I close with an illustration, and we, we worship. But look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. You know, this is sometimes we do this love chapter like we do the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and so forth. And we all know the first part, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not brag, and is not arrogant, and so forth. If we don't get down to verse 13, we miss what love is all about. Verse 13 says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's the love of God. Now, when it says bears all things, it could be better described because it seems to be the same as endures all things. That bears all things means that it it covers. And, and what we're saying here is, I know that you're in a difficult time right now. I'm not going to publicly expose you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm going to throw a, a blanket over you right now. And under this blanket of protection, I'm going to let you grow up. Uh, and there's things that you need to understand when it says it's love. It says it believes all things. It's not naive. That's not what it's saying. It's saying... I believe things about you that you don't even believe. Jesus said to his disciples, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They didn't understand what that was. Jesus saw it. He knew what he was doing. And then it says, not only does it believe all things, it hopes all things. You know, I know this is where you're at right now. I see where you can be and I will, I hope is the expectation of certainty, I'm going to see it through. And endure means I'm here for as long as it takes. I'm here. That kind of love never fails. I shared this passage out at the prison. We have a prison ministry out at Clallam Bay Prison. And um, I shared this passage about throwing a blanket. You know, we do this with our children. When our children are socially maladjusted and they do weird things like come into a gathering of adults and right in the middle of that gathering, mess their pants. We think, well, you, that's so embarrassing. Is this kid, what is wrong with this? No, you just sweep that little kid out, and mamas usually do, sweep that little kid out, there, and you protect that child. They may not do everything properly, but you're not trying to expose them. You're trying to protect them because you know something? I hope you're going to be better than this kid. You're going to be better you got a lot to learn. you got a lot of potential here. And I, I hope for that. And I'm right here till it all comes about. Oh, I'm so thankful my Heavenly Father covers me. He says, you're not all you should be or could be right now. But I'm here. And I see things that you don't even see right now. But one day it'll be true for you. And I'll be right here until it happens. I'll be right here with you. Perhaps you saw what I saw a number of months back when I was watching the um, Billy Graham funeral service. I, I had to go to a meeting to get to see all of it, but most of it I saw some of the eulogy. Did any of you watch that Billy Graham funeral service? It was an incredible service, just simple but very good. One of the people that shared on that eulogy was their daughter. I want to read this to you, and it's... Uh, Ruth's testimony. Ruth Graham tells the story of her father's warm embrace. My father was not God, but he showed me what God is like that day. I am so grateful God accepts me as I am, hurting, wounded, and broken. I've learned in the weeks uh, since my father's death that everybody has a Billy Graham story. But I have my own Billy Graham story. Some of you may have heard it many times, but it bears repeating because it speaks to the essence of who my father was and is. After 21 years, 
my marriage ended in divorce. I was devastated. I was floundering. My husband had betrayed me at the deepest levels. I understood I had biblical grounds for divorce, but I did not want to be divorced. I did not want to hurt or displease God in any way. My family thought it would be a good idea for me to move away from Shenandoah Valley to get a fresh start somewhere. So I decided to live in Florida near my older sister, Gigi, and her family, and near a good church. The pastor of that church introduced me to a handsome widower, and we began to date fast and furiously. My children didn't like him, but I thought, they're almost grown, and they can't tell me what to do. I knew what was best for my life. My mother called me from Seattle. My father called me from Tokyo, and they said, Honey, why don't you slow down? Let us get to know this man. They had never been single. They had never been divorced. What did they know? So being stubborn, willful, and sinful, I married this man on New Year's Eve, and within 24 hours, I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. After five weeks, I fled. I was afraid of him. What was I going to do? I wanted to go talk to my mother and my father. On my way home, I stopped and picked up my daughter, Windsor, from boarding school. I felt wretched. I was coming home with my life in pieces. Shame weighed me down. I dreaded having to see my parents' gaze. I didn't think I could handle what their eyes might communicate. I wanted to run and hide, but I could not. I had nowhere else to go. I could not undo my mistake. I knew I had, fa I had to face it. I felt unworthy to go home, but I needed my parents. I look back now, overwhelmed by God's tenderness and timing, for it was this, that my darkest hour, that God stepped in with one of the most powerful metaphors of my life. It was a two-day drive to home, question whirled in my mind. What was I going to say to Daddy? What was I going to say to Mother? What was I going to say to my children? I've been such a failure. What were they going to do, and what were they going to say to me? Maybe something like, we're tired of fooling with you. We told you not to do it. You've embarrassed us. Many of you know that we live in the side of a, of a mountain. And as I wound my way up, up the mountain, I wound it around my last turn, the bend of my father's driveway. And my father was standing there waiting for me. My father, who had every reason to rebuke, wrapped his arms around me, pulled me into a warm embrace, and greeted me with these simple words, welcome home. There was no shame. There was no blame. There was no condemnation, just unconditional love. My father's embrace at that moment was one of the most profound gestures of acceptance I've ever experienced. To be utterly broken and still accepted, to feel ugly and yet be loved, to feel like an outcast and to be welcomed. I marveled at the contrast between my heart, full of shame and regret, and my father, so full of love. I must have felt many things at once in his arms, shock, relief gratitude, safety, disbelief, one thing I most definitely felt was shattered. And through his embrace, my father let me know that I had permission to feel the way I was. He was not condemning me. No defense or explanation was required. My father was not God, but he showed me what God is like that day. His one act of grace changed my life and informed me of who I am. I'm so grateful God accepts me as I am, hurting, wounded, broken. I'm glad he chooses me to be part of his family. Regardless of my past mistakes and sins, he wants me. He cares about me. His arms are open to me at all times. Even when I'm in ruins, God stands watching the road, eager for me to come to him. God doesn't stop at ruin. It's where he begins, and brokenness is a qualification for service for him. God does not hold his hand a list of failures. He's not waiting to judge me. He's waiting to be with me. 
He's waiting to embrace me and welcome me home. And she says, and his invitation is open to you. Be this kind of father. Be this kind of repentant sinner. And know that God says, welcome home. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this rich story. This rich story that closes the chasm of time and age and years and, and embraces us in our moment right now. And above all, we hear your heart, Lord. We hear your words. We hear your hope. And maybe there's some that are feeling that love, that forgiveness, that extravagant acceptance, and we celebrate with them. If they have not, they may do so even now. For your glory, we pray. Amen.